For over four years, Oda has been toying with us, randomly revealing very vague information on the God Valley incident. With the introduction of Kuma's backstory, Oda has however been slowly, but surely, revealing more and more details about the God Valley incident to us. With Kuma's backstory, Oda decided to explore avenues that added even more meaning to the soon-to-begin revolution. For as Monkey D. Dragon recently revealed in the recent chapters, the revolution begins now. With Kuma's backstory, Oda introduced us to the manner in which the world government grew to have over 150 countries under its banner. So it appears that their plan had always been to conquer all of the unallied nations eventually. The exorbitant amount that is the heavenly tribute is the major reason that has caused many nations not to join the world government, as some nations are just too poor. This might of course have been a well-calculated plan by the celestial dragons, so as to ensure that there will always be nations that they can conquer. The native hunting competition only adds fuel to the flames as it adds to the long lists of crimes committed by the members of these 19 founding families on the citizens of the world. This is of course going to be one of the driving factors that will lead to a worldwide revolution. If you guys cannot wait to see the revolution begin, please be sure to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel for more. Without further ado, let us begin. This chapter in my humble opinion is by far the best chapter of the year, not only because of the characters present, but also because of the sheer amounts of reveals that we got in some panels. This is the reason why this chapter analysis will probably be longer than normal. The MC of the Celestial Dragons revealed the rules of the native hunting competition. The natives and slaves were termed rabbits, which seems convenient since all of them are now targets. Before I proceed, I wanted to rectify a specific statement I had been alluding to in previous videos. The mark on Kuma's back was not a different Celestial Dragon's crest, but rather the bull's eye, which signified that the slaves were all targets. Of the rabbit, 13 were considered special. Of these 13, I believe Kuma was one of them. We do not know who the other 12 were, and why they were also considered special. Maybe it had to do with their race, and their affiliations with Nika. They could also have been Lunarians amongst the slaves. Maybe King's family was captured as well. 150 slaves were considered rare rabbits. I believe Ivankov and Ginny were part of these rare rabbits. The residents of God Valley amounted to 100,000. 200 celestial dragons were to take part in this competition. Of those 200, 9 of them were noteworthy, which were drawn by Oda in the rear. I believe these 9 were the god knights, as we know they were revealed to be 9 in number. Of those 9, 4 were given the spotlight and of those 4, 2 of their family names have been revealed. The Figarland family name was previously revealed. In this chapter, Oda introduced yet another family name, which was none other than the Manmaya family. It is uncertain whether these three were Garling's main competitors, but I think it is safe to assume that is the case. With the competition set to begin in an hour's time, the rabbits all made their escape. I am going to assume that Kong and Garp's discussion took place a while back, because Garp himself straight up confirmed that God Valley was pretty far. Kong was begging Garp to head for God Valley and help keep the Celestial Dragons safe, as he had received a report that the Rock's pirates will be heading for God Valley as well. Their reason for heading to God Valley was to reclaim the crown jewel of Beehive Island that had somehow been stolen by someone. I believe that this was the work of CP-0, as carrying out such a task would have required tremendous amounts of stealth, so I do not really see how the navy would have pulled this off. Garp was uninterested, as he told Kong that they are only ripping what they sow. There would of course be repercussions for stealing the crown jewel of Beehive Island. The fact that Kong was surprised that Garp was aware of the crown jewel alludes to this being a top secret mission which probably alluded to CP-0 being involved. Even though escorts had been dispatched to take care of the threat, they could not handle the Roger and Rock's pirates at the same time. Roger also made his move, and was also heading for God Valley. Being the good sportsman that he was, Garp decided to head for God Valley as well. The fact that Garp and the reinforcements made it in time meant that this discussion took place a while back. With one hour left for the competition to begin, Ivankov tried his best to convince the slaves that were willing to listen to him that it was possible for them to survive until the end. They were not just going to sit there and wait, but rather fight back in their own way. Their plan was staged in two phases. The first part of the plan was heavily reliant on Ginny's skills. 
Ginny made use of her wire tapping skills to not only get information on the prizes that were to be awarded to the winners of the competition, but also to broadcast this information to other islands, in hopes that pirates who were interested in these treasures will inadvertently show up to the island in order to claim the treasure as theirs. This part of the plan was completed two weeks prior to the competition, so it is thanks to Ginny that the Rocks and Roger pirates made their way to the island. Two of the prizes were revealed. One was the mythical Zoan model Azure Dragon, which Big Mom eventually gave Kaido. The other was the Paw Paw Fruit, which Kuma eventually ate. Their goal was at the bare minimum to steal these fruits and use the fruit's powers to enable them escape. This was going to be possible by making use of the ensuing chaos that the pirates would bring the moment they arrived on the island. This would thus have provided them with a perfect opportunity to swoop in and claim the fruits as the navy and celestial dragons will be distracted by the pirates. Even so, they needed a diversion, and Kuma opted to be the diversion. Kuma displayed a great sense of responsibility as he knew that he was born with strength and endurance that was greater than the average humans. So he decided he was going to do his best to make this mission a success. The competition began, and Garling was revealed to already have 10,000 points, since he previously had a penalty of 10,000 points prior to the competition's beginning. He must have already killed two special rabbits. The competition was broadcasted in Marajoa, and we can tell that Garling was pretty popular with the ladies. The Rocks pirates arrived on the east side of the island, and in pretty much Oda style, Rocks went off ahead. Oda then proceeded to reveal the Rocks pirates' core crew, which consisted of nine members other than Rocks. We already knew that Whitebeard, Shiki, Big Mom, Captain John, Wang Ji and Silver Axe, and Miss Bucking were all part of the Rocks Pirates. I believe the biggest reveal of this chapter was the identity of the final member of the crew. And what a shocker it was. Gloriosa, who was once the Empress of Amazon Lily, turned out to be part of the Rocks Pirates. I believe many had speculated that Shaki was going to be the final member because of her affiliations with Rayleigh and Amazon Lily, as well as the fact that she was revealed to have been a notorious pirate back in the day. It was also the first time in the story that Oda clearly drew the full features of all core members. Captain John, Silver Axe and Wang Ji were always assumed to be deceased, since many in the community assumed them to have been part of Moriah's general zombies. Oda later on revealed this not to be true, as it seems that Wang Ji returned to Beehive Island and became the island's ruler. So, Wang Ji could not have been deceased since this event was pretty recent. It is for this reason that I believe that Oda did not draw them in the panel that showed all the members of the Rock's Pirates. This might possibly be hinting at a possible comeback from Wang Ji. Let us not forget that Blackbeard, who had two insane devil fruits, could not defeat him in a 1v1 battle and needed an assist from Kobe. With the recent events that occurred on Beehive Island, if Blackbeard did not kill Wang Ji, and locked him up in the dungeon, he might have escaped as well. If you guys want to see Wang Ji and Silver Axe return in the story, let me know in the comments section. Oda used a single panel to show us that the Rocks Pirates were not a united unit. All of the members saw themselves as leaders, and were all in it for some ulterior motive. Whitebeard, maybe for money, in order to support his native land Sphinx Island. Kaido somewhat respected Rocks, Big Mom and Shiki were probably just in it because it guaranteed awesome loots. That could also have been the case for the others. This disunity is what Kaido previously alluded to when he saw Luffy display his conqueror's hacky after his defeat, as he said having too many kings and a crew could be problematic. The Roger pirates, as well as many other pirate crews arrived on the western side of the island. Roger seemed to be grumbling about something that happened one year ago. It is safe to assume that Rox might have either defeated Roger or taken something from Roger, which Roger wanted back. Rayleigh immediately assessing the situation, knew this was going to be tough, whereas Scopper was more concerned with Roger not having special captain privileges in this event. What Oda made a point to highlight in these panels was that the island was being invaded from all angles, as the navy ships were constantly attacked by an increasing number of incoming ships. With both the Roger and Rock's pirates set to clash, collateral damage was unavoidable. It is for this reason that Garling and the God Knights decided to fight against the incoming threats, while the Navy soldiers protected the Celestial Dragons. Garp and his good friend Bogard, and some Navy forces finally arrived and immediately jumped into the fray. 
With all of the ensuing chaos, it was safe to assume that the native hunting competition was put on halt due to this interference. If that was the case, why was Garling then introduced to be the champion of God Valley? There are still many questions that Oda failed to answer in this chapter. For instance, what were the prices in the four other treasure chests? How did Shanks find himself in one of the treasure chests? And what was the identity of the crown jewel of Beehive Island? Ginny and Ivankov's plan succeeded, as Ivankov and Kuma got their hands on the two devil fruits that they were planning to steal. That said, before Ivankov could consume the mythical Zoan model dragon fruit, Big Mom swooped in and seized the fruit. She also wanted to get Kuma's fruit, but Kuma ate it. It was at this moment that Saturn appeared, having apparently summoned himself, as we could see the flames and sparks of black lightning in the background. Kuma and Saturn's interaction was by far the most important part of the chapter, as it clearly showed us that Kuma is the closest character that we could relate to a saint in the story. Saturn said that Kuma, who was a buccaneer, was born as a slave and was to die as one. Kuma asked Saturn if he was an important personality. He proceeded to say that he never understood why anyone would be born to be superior to another. That was the reason why if he could manifest any sort of power, he would try to free the slaves like Nika did. Saturn of course enraged by Kuma's statements, stated that, that was the reason why he had to be eliminated like all the others. I do not know what the buccaneers did, but this backstory has really shown us that the five elders seem to have a deep-rooted hatred for this race. Not only was it previously revealed that the five elders had spies in the hospitals, who screened newborn kids for buccaneer blood, but the manner in which Saturn stated that they all needed to be eliminated alluded to something else. The crime that the buccaneer committed must have greatly impacted Saturn in particular. It made no sense to me for Saturn to summon himself before Kuma when the island was teeming with powerhouses, who were threatening the lives of his fellow celestial dragons. Rather than saving his comrades, he prioritized killing Kuma. Oda never revealed the details, but Kuma somehow managed to escape and save 500 people in the process. This was probably due to his newly found pawpaw -paw abilities. Kuma, Ginny and Ivankov returned to the Sorbet Kingdom of South Blue. Kuma's house was revealed to be a church. Now we know where Kuma got his Bible from. He still felt remorseful, as there were many slaves that he did not save on that day. Ivankov told him that he did his best. That was enough. A short while later, Ivankov headed out to sea to start his own adventures. Kuma and Ginny remained in the Sorbet Kingdom. Rather than taking the easy route, Kuma and Ginny began working as firewood sellers. Thanks to this, they could make ends meet. Ginny and Kuma were overjoyed to have had their first meal and been satisfied with the meal. This meal definitely tasted different. This was a meal they had free of troubles, free of fears, free of the shackles of slavery. This was the beginning of their newfound freedom. Sometime later, Kuma was attacked by some kids, and since he could not defend himself, Ginny stepped in and roughed them up, giving them the beating that they deserved. Even after all of this, Kuma used his powers to send their pain away. This would be the beginning of an amazing story, of how a slave boy started from nothing, and eventually became the king of a nation. These two kids who previously attacked Kuma became close friends with Ginny and Kuma. This relationship would continue as over 36 years after this flashback occurred. Oda will reveal these two kids to be part of Jewelry Bonnie's crew. Well there you have it guys, let me know your thoughts about the chapter. Be sure to subscribe to the channel for more. I am your host Sean, and I'll see you guys in the next one.